thank you very much for joining us tonight. Um, we're here tonight to talk a little bit about um, Neil Brown and his strategic farm um, journey that he's been on, particularly focusing um, on forage this time. So just as a bit of an introduction to myself, I'm Emma, I work in the Knowledge Exchange team. Um, I cover the Midlands region and um, I work with Neil through his strategic farm programme. We also have with us tonight Neil, who's going to introduce himself and the farm shortly. Mark Jones, who is a forage specialist and works with Neil through his strategic farm involvement. And Leah as well, who works with me in the knowledge exchange team and covers the Southwest region. Um, Leah will be covering a lot of the back office side of the program programming tonight. So all the technology. So um, she'll disappear shortly and then pop back up when you have questions that you want asking. So just a bit of an introduction first on how to use the technology. You should have these boxes on your screen. If you click the little yellow arrow, um, that will bring out the bigger box that you can see on the right hand side. And near step two, you can see type your question here. If you type your question there and click send, that will send it through um, to Leah, who will be able to ask those questions on your behalf. So just to get people started with that, please, if you'd just like to tell us which county you're watching from tonight. Um, so Leah will watch those responses as they come through. But just a bit of a reminder while you're doing that, um, we're not saving up questions until the end of the webinar tonight. We're going to ask questions throughout. So please, as, um, as you have them, type them in. Leah will ask them on your behalf. You will remain muted throughout. So um, you won't be able to speak to us. But again, if you do have questions, comments, um, if something's not working, please just write it in the questions box and we'll pick that up. And this session will be recorded. So if you wanted to send it on to a friend afterwards or watch it again, it'll be on the AHDB Beef and Lamb YouTube channel, usually about two days after we've recorded. Um, just as a bit of an agenda tonight, we're going to be talking about some of the changes that Neil has made and is in the process of making on his farm. He's he's quite early on in his changing his grassland management. Um, so we'll be following it really from the start. Um, and then Mark is going to add the why to why Neil is making some of these changes and adding some context um, on some of the science. So just before we get going properly then, Leah, where are people phoning in from? Um, there's a bit of a variety. So we've got Cheshire, Northumberland, Devon, Cornwall, Essex and North Yorkshire. Brilliant. So the main thing is that you're all able to ask questions. So you've now got no excuse not to do it as we're going along. So it's working. So thank you very much, Leah. Um, Neil, then, just to get us started, not everybody here tonight may have joined some of your um, events before. So did you just want to talk us a little bit through a background to your system? Um, and yeah, just explain what you do at Newhouse. Hello, welcome. Um, so yeah, at Newhouse Farm, we're um, a family owned uh, business. Um, we're tapping about 800 ewes, including ewe lambs. We're calving about 30 suckler cows. Um, we've got 40 acres of arable rotation. Primarily is um, barley and root crops. Um, we take all cattle through to finishing and lambs. Um, and we're mainly Suffolk cross mules and North Country mules. North Country mules are bought in as ewe lamb replacements and the Suffolks are home bred and tucked as hogs as well. Brilliant. And did you just want to give us a bit of an update on what you've been up to since October, which was um, when we had our last event? So, yeah, um, we tapped about 650 ewes, 130 hogs. Um, we bolused all the ewes and ewe lambs this year. Um, we've done, we've scanned them all now. So we've, the ewes have scanned 191%. Um, with 2.2% barren rate and the hogs 130% and 9% barren rate. Brilliant, thank you very much. So 
One of the things um, that you wanted to address as a priority when you joined the Strategic Farm Programme was grassland. So I just want to cover over the next 10, 15 minutes or so kind of your reasons for wanting to do that. So if I'll just stop sharing my screen. There you go. Um, so some of your reasons for doing that. So can you just explain what your grazing strategies have been previously? So so in the past, we mainly set stocked. Um, we don't graze any pastures too tight. We always sort of rotate them round, but not by splitting fields up or anything. It's just moving field by field, really. Um, we wean lambs onto forage rape normally. So we sort of grow sort of 10, 12 acres of forage rape, which will um, hold about four or 500 lambs on over the summer. Um, and then we rotate the lambs then around the grassland after that. Um, normally all the yearlings get sent away on um, winter keep. Um, and if we do have stubble turnips um, in our arable rotation, um, normally, or if we have fat lambs left over, fat lambs will go on to that. Um, but I'll try and get the ewe lambs onto the root crops as well. Um, and that's about it, really. Um, with that system, what do you think worked particularly well and what maybe you weren't so happy with, if there is anything? So the forage rate works well in the summer because that we can hold a lot of lambs on that and get them off the grass when we've um, we've got the grass shut up for mowing. Um, ideally, could do with more sheep away in the winter. Um, and probably we do like to keep our ewes and lambs in small bunches. So we're sort of 50 ewes and lambs in a bunch is, is plenty for us normally. Um, but we're obviously going to be trying to um, get into the habit of having bigger bunches of ewes and lambs to rotate them around. So um, uh, getting used to having bigger bunches really. So and sort of tupping groups would normally be a sort of 100 ewes in a bunch as well. So that's about where we are. And you touched on then about getting lambs away quicker. When just remind us when you lamb. So we lamb from mid March, the Suffolk's first, then the mules from end of March, and then the yearlings and the hogs then from the first of April. Or from and the when, 5th of April. And when have you generally got all lambs gone by then, just as a point of reference? So normally we, most lambs are gone before we start lambing, but so yeah it, uh, too many are carried over to the following year um but this year they, we've managed to sell them all before christmas brilliant and mark in a few day a few days a few years down the line what could neil be kind of hoping to get to with that where should he be hoping to have kind of got rid of lambs by yeah uh, i suppose he'd be really aiming to get them away uh, before tapping time. And then um, you'll have more grass around for tapping. And then I'm sure you, you say you, you've probably got plenty enough uh, lamb into the scanning percentage, but um, you can keep those ewes in better condition uh, after tapping as well. Um, while you're obviously tapping new lambs, you can always have a few of those floating around at the back end. But um, if you can try and move the majority uh, that little bit earlier, just gives us the option to keep uh, keep more sheep during that winter period as well. Yeah. So Neil, why why did you want to get more from your forage? What was the your reasoning behind it? So um, we farm bench the enterprise um, against other similar businesses, and um, from looking at the farm bench results, that um, our feed costs are very high. So um, I want to try and make better use of the grass um, and look at making better quality silage for the young stock and maybe the ewes. Um, and also been looking at um, soil sampling more as well. So we can look at our fertilizer use more and, um, and improve things that way, really. OK, and I think um we're probably guilty as farmers as sometimes taking our grasslands for granted. So, Mark, what do you think the added value of focusing on forage could be? And I'm just going to show you a slide as well that you've got for this. 
Yeah. So um, in terms of uh, the advantages you're going to get, um, well, I suppose just looking at that, that chart just to explain it, we've um, historically, you can see the land price. There's usually a bit of a peak in um, April, May, June. And then you, you always get to August, September, October, where there's a real lull in the, in the price. So generally, I suppose if farms are feeding creep feed all the way along, it's obviously going to be quite profitable to do it um, April, May, June. But you're selling a lot of lambs later in that season. Obviously, it gets to a stage where you're, you're losing money on them. So really, we're, we're wanting to try and uh, focus on the system. So maybe for early lambing uh, farms sort of mid-February, you wanted to put quite a bit of creep feed into them and get them gone in May and June and uh, even the first half of July. But after that, it's then focusing on good grassland management to try and get them away off as, as cheap as you can before you start having to feed them into November, December before the grass quality disappears. So really, we want to be focusing on getting those lambs away quicker, getting higher growth rates um, through you know, high clover content in a lot of those, those grass woods. Uh, again, the use of red clover. Um, a thing that a lot of farmers forget about is, is the quality of silage, especially for, for cattle and sheep during that winter period. Um, you know, that could probably save you 10 grand, 15 grand by just getting that silage uh, of, of very high quality. And then the other aspect which is always forgotten is if your grassland management is better, your stocking rate is going to be so much higher. So, for instance, you could uh, Mr. Average might be at two and a half using acre, while the top third might be at four using acre. I think the potential there, um, you know, across a, a flock, I think I've written it down somewhere uh, later in, which we'll, we'll get back to. But again, it's about 20 grand on a 250 acre farm. So you can see how the, the profits on these farms can almost double with, with good grass to manage them. And you mentioned food a little bit there as well and getting the silage right to reduce that feed did you just want to talk us through what some of Neil's concentrate costs have been as one of the reasons to get more from his forage yeah so um with the sheep on the on the left hand side uh, to be fair uh he hasn't been feeding the sheep a, a heck of a lot uh compared to to average so he's not really over the over average there so he's feeding about what have we got there? 18 ton, uh, about four and a half grand, plus a, a few ton of molasses. It's about 28 kilos per sheep or about seven pounds. Um, so again, the average is about 35 kilos. So you're not talking a major difference there, you're slightly under. But where the big issue is, um, is creep feed. So we can see with the lambs a little bit lower down, there's about 72 ton of creep feed going out. Um, I think this was this the 1920 year. Yeah. Yeah. And um, again, you know, that's 17, 18 thousand pounds. Well, that's a that's a huge amount when you you're looking to when you're looking for those extra lamb sales. So if that could be done off grass, um, or even reduce it by 80%, you know, there's there's a lot of money there which can be kept in your own pocket. So I think. Um, when we're taking into account all of that creep feed, it works out at £29 per ewe uh, compared to £11 uh, for a normal or average farm. And what I was getting at with that slide I showed before, um, you know, if you're selling a lot of lambs in August, September, October time, there's not really a need to be creep feeding because you're, you're losing money on, on those lambs um, with the creep feed. If you're mid-February lambing, and getting them away earlier, it's a, a different story. And then with the with the cows, again, um, I think there's, there's a reliance on what I would describe as suckless silage, really. Um, so there isn't quite the quality there. So you're talking nine and a half ME silage, and it just means that you're having to feed quite a lot of concentrates um, to the store cattle in the first year, but also to the finishing cattle to, to get them gone and get them away. So if we can increase the quality of the silage um, by quite a bit, it will make a huge difference in terms of the amount, the amount fed. Again, with the grassland management, uh, if we're able to rotationally graze uh, some of the store cattle, hopefully we we'll actually be able to get them away at 18 months before they're actually housed again. Yes, at lighter weights, 
groups that um, with those big costs during the winter period with feed and you know store prices at the moment, it's probably break even at best feeding feeding cattle through the winter. So if you can sell them lighter straight off grass, uh, it's going to be more profitable and then lead to you know you don't have to make so much silage and again there's more acres available for more cows so you can see how it all stacks up in the end yeah and if if we reduce that hard feed um mark does that automatically mean that we're going to lose growth or can we have the same sim or similar levels of growth on a forage based diet yeah it, it all depends on the system so um Generally, if, if you're creek feeding lambs and you've got adequate grass in front of them, um, you shouldn't, generally what you'll find is that they're eating more creep instead of, of grass. So the growth rates don't actually drop away too much. If there is a shortage or you're going into a drought, uh, for instance, like you, you would have had in, in May and um, you were short of grass, then it's beneficial to creek feed to, to keep those lambs going, uh, going quite quickly. And it's the same, same situation um obviously with housing the cattle in the winter um again that better quality silage just means you wouldn't need to feed and quite often in that that first year of store cattle um if you pump them full of concentrates and you're doing 1.5 kilos all the way through the through the winter um as soon as you turn them out to grass then they're just going to stand still for six to eight weeks well if you fed them on silage alone good quality ticked over at 0 0.7 0 0.8 of a kilo after turnout, uh, those cattle would actually go on and grow and probably compensating that growth, if that makes sense. So it's all about your system and, and getting it all right for, for what you're doing. And if we are going to be improving our grasslands um, and putting more into our grasslands, does that just mean more fur and inputs that negate the benefits of saving the feed or how does that kind of work out? There'll be, a, there'll be a certain amount needed to, to get the soils right if, if they are quite a bit out. So pH, um, I think Neil was pretty good for, for lime throughout, to be fair, uh, but you were low in phosphate. So we'd, ex we'd want them to, to increase the phosphate. So whether that's through the use of triple superphosphate every year, just to increase uh, the reserves there to, to maximise grass growth. Um, and then there may be we'd also want a little bit more reseeding so uh, you'll see in some of the pictures later there's a, there's a lot of permanent pasture on the farm and again that leads to those lower growth rates for those lambs in, in mid-season so we can get better grasses which will cost a little bit more to start with but once you're in the system and I suppose you should be looking at almost 10 percent of the farm being reseeded each year up to that kind of level and again if your pH uh, P and Ks are correct. There's no reason why that sward can't be in for 20, 30 years and that ryegrass and clover be maintained in that sward if it's managed well. Yeah. Um, Lee has popped up, which means we've got questions or problems or both. So, <laughs> Leah, I'll hand over to you. Just a quick question for Mark. Um, what organic forage crop for ewes or lambs will generally give the highest um, protein percentage and what would that percentage be? <coughs> Well, I suppose um, grass clover lays can be 20-25% protein, uh, which is almost too much, uh, especially in the spring, and it drops off as you're going into the, the summer. Um, really looking for very highly digestible swords with high protein uh, or crops. So again, rape um, is ideal in, in the summer. Again, very high uh, digestibility and protein, probably 17-18%. Uh, you've then got uh, your red clover lays, again, high protein. It's the high protein which really finishes lambs and gets them uh, up on, onto those growth rates. And then you've got chic chicory, plantain and the herbs. And again, they're going to be 20% plus. And then even lucerne, not a lot of farmers are grazing lucerne. Uh, but again, you're into 20 plus in terms of, of protein content in, in those swords. Okay. And we've spoken a bit about um, productivity and growth and profitability, but what are kind of mark the less tangible benefits of having your own homegrown forage and not relying on input um, inputs like feed? What what are kind of the non tangible bits of that? Yeah, well, I suppose it's 
you're more sustainable at home on the farm. So, um, for instance, I think rolled barley now you could buy it for about 180 pound a ton. Well, you know, last year it could have been 120, 130 pound per ton. So again, there's less reliance on that big jump in, in feed price if you are buying a lot in. And again, you just wouldn't need to buy it. So I'd cost, say, for concentrate for sheep, for instance, is 240 pound a ton or 24 pence if it works out per kilo. Well, grass is at six pence and silage at 12 pence. So if you can produce very good silage, um, I know organic farmers won't, you know, if they've got 12 ME silage, they're not actually feeding any any supplements at all to their twins. So it, it's just fins like that, which can be tweaked um, just to reduce your reliance. Mm -hmm. And then the concentrates can come in at the edges of the year or in times where you're struggling just to, to top up, if that makes sense. Yeah, OK. So what we're going to do now is we're going to try something a bit new to me anyway, and we're going to try and do a poll. Um, so Leah, did you just want to try and do our little ask the audience and talk us through that? Yeah, so on your screen now you should see um, a poll and, and it's multiple choice. So on average, how much of the grass you grow do you think is utilised by set stocked grazing? And you can select one answer. Uh, 45%, 50%, 60%, 65% or 70% and we'll just leave that open for a minute. And just just while that's open, Mark, why is utilisation important as well as productivity and just producing more grass? Yeah, so it just means that the grass that's available to the stock to eat um, is, is more of it there for them. So how I would explain it is um if you see fields uh, with sheep in probably in July and August time, you might see a lot of sheep with um, grass seed heads, you know, up to the top of their legs. Well, all that grass is, is what they're not eating because it wasn't managed properly at the start. So if you were able to keep it uh, a lot shorter and in that vegetative state, you're able to utilise all the grass um, all the time, if that makes sense. So essentially you're able to keep a higher stocking rate by managing the grass or, or utilising the grass better. Brilliant. Leah, have we got any results from that then of what people kind of think? Yeah, I think they've stopped voting now, so I'll close the poll. Um, the results were, so again for the question, it was on average how much of the grass you grow do you think is utilised by set stocked grazing? 4% of the audience said 45%, 36% said 50% utilised. Sorry, Leah, can you just share the results? Uh, oh, yeah, sorry, there you go. Thank can you. you see them now? Yep. Okay, do you want me to read them out? Uh, yeah, go on. All right, so 4% uh, of the audience selected 45%, 36% voted for 50 32% voted for 60, 21% voted for 65, and then 7% voted for 70. So I guess the majority vote went for 50% utilised. So Mark, what is it? Yeah, well, the, the answer is actually 50%, but um, I suppose the, the other point with it is you can get farmers who are also very good at set stocking and could add stock or take stock away. And there's no reason why they couldn't increase it to 60 or 70 percent of it is it's done very well as well and that's by set stocking set stocking you could <coughs> increase it by that then yeah yeah i suppose rather than just shutting the gate and leaving the sheep in yeah. there all summer you, you manage it a bit better by adding sheep to it or, or taking sheep away at the same time and what would be the financial benefit of improving that utilization do we have any numbers to put to it or anything yeah so i suppose what we're we're really looking at if you could increase utilization from about 50% up to 80%, that would be the equivalent of increasing, uh, I suppose, stock numbers from two and a half ewes an acre up to four an acre, if that makes sense. And if we're looking at a, say, a 50 pound gross margin, which is probably a bit on the low side for a, for a lowland flock, that'd be 75 pounds per acre or for a 300 acre farm we'd be up to about 22,500 pounds so you can see how Stacks that up. extra stocking rate can really add up across a across an average size farm. 
Yeah. So just moving a little bit from grazed forage onto conserved forage, and we've mentioned silage a little bit already, but Neil, can you just tell me about what you did differently with your silage prep this year compared to previous years? So yeah, so um, if we're making silage for the young stock, for the weanlings, then um, we've been sort of cutting it a lot earlier so, um, before it goes to head. Um, and sort of tedding it uh, once within the hour of mowing as well. So the least times I can move it, the better, but um, it's faster drying if I can ted it within an hour of mowing it. Um, we've gone to six layers of wrap, which seems to help keep the silage better. Um, leaving it sort of a day, day and a half after you're mowing it before baling it up. Um, and and was, that, putting, was that more or less time than you were doing previously or how is that different? Um, probably leave it longer than that really, two, maybe two or three days but okay. the problem with us is we're making our silage far too dry, um, you know sort of 50-60% dry matter for our silage so it's too dry so we're trying to bail it sooner um, without being too wet but bailing it sooner and younger um, so that's for the young stock and then maybe look at feeding the ewe silage we never, in the past we've never fed ewe silage um, always made hay for the sheep they always thought drier the better for ewes but um, can't seem to we make lovely hay but just can't seem to make quality hay <laughs> so and in the last week or so we've had um one of your silage analyses back and it is just one analysis um of the sample that you took but mark did you just want to comment a little bit on what we learned from that analysis yeah so um the, the analysis um came back at about um nine and a half me and crude protein of about 10. so again the quality wasn't really as, as high as we would have liked it but I suppose at the, at the time, uh, the field that was being harvested was West Wald, which would have been the beginning its second season. I think it might have been. And um, again, we had that very dry period, so it headed a lot earlier than what it would have in a, a normal season as well. So just with that, that combination, although we'd you probably cut it a good week, 10 days earlier than what, what you would have normally, you probably would have had to cut it about a you know, another 10 days or a fortnight earlier again. So that is a slight problem with, with the use of Westerworlds, really. Uh, it's a bulky crop, but it just hadn't quite got the digestibility of uh, your ryegrasses. So um, in the autumn, Neil's put in quite a bit of a, a, a red clover perennial ryegrass lay. So again, for next season, the hope is that we'll have a, a silage with much higher ME. Ideally, we're looking to try and get up to 11, 11 and a half ME, with the aim that they can be on ad lib silage, say for the steers and the, the heifers in that stored period, and hopefully gain about 0.7 of a kilo with, with no supplement at all. So, currently, with a 9.5 ME silage, which is fine for suckler cows, um, you're having to supplement with a couple of kilos of concentrates just to get them at that 0 0.7, 0 0.8 of a kilo, if that makes sense. So. Uh, silage is that silage quality is, is really uh, of great importance. Brilliant. Leah, have we got any questions coming through? Just the one, and it's for Mark. Um, can grazing lambs on herbal lays like chicory mean that you can reduce your worming treatments? Yeah, it, ha it has been shown um, that uh, there is less worm burden on the crop because they, they can't seem to be able to crawl up it quite the same, but also because of the, the tann tannins as well. Um, the other important thing, again, with the herbal lays, is that you don't tend to graze them quite as hard as you would with a ryegrass clover lay. So again, uh, you'll find that most of the worm burden is lower down on the leaves, if that makes sense. So if you're leaving a slightly higher residual, um, those sh sheep and lambs are going to be less uh, prone to, to worms as well, if that makes sense. <clears throat> oh, I've got another one now. Um, are other grasses such as, um, I, I'm not going to be able to pronounce that one, are other grasses such as Timothy Coxfoot, um, are, are they any good for silage? Um, this this 
uh, person says we sometimes struggle with ryegrass if it comes dry. Yeah, there's there's no reason why you can't use Coxfoot and Timothy. Uh, again, Timothy heads a little bit later. Uh, Coxfoot tends to head a little bit earlier. Um, but once it's headed in May, you can generally keep it keep it quite well. I think it's just a matter of the same principles really. Um, to to keep that very high quality, you want to be cutting it before you see a seed head. And as soon as those seed heads start emerging, uh, the quality and digestibility, no matter what the grass, will really drop off. Um, the other thing is with rye grass in some of these very hot, dry spells, it gets stressed. And I've seen it put a seed head up at just a couple of inches in, in, in height. So again, with some of these dry spells we're having, uh, rye grass can struggle a little bit and some of those alternatives uh, really help. And one for Neil. What date did you mow your silage grass this year? Um, first cut was done um, end of May. Thank you. That's all I've got now, Emma. Brilliant. Thank you. So just to talk about some of the changes and get into some more of the detail about the changes you've made then, Neil. So you tried to start changing your grazing management, grassland management um, last year, which of course coincided with the drought that we had um, in early 2020, which wasn't ideal. But can you just talk me through kind of the changes that you made early last year and then what happened? So yeah, so we, we tried to um, start rotational grazing uh, last May. Um, probably didn't rest enough grass over the winter to give us enough cover in the spring. Um, but we come very dry in May and sort of burnt up. Um, so I sort of mobbed up the ewes and lambs into bunches of 200. And then I was starting to split the fields up and rotate them round. So I started that, which was working well, but the grass wasn't growing back. It was just burning up. So um, I didn't have any grass coming back for them to move back onto. So um, I ended up having to take the fences up and just let them run the fields and just keep rotating them around the fields um, instead of smaller paddocks. But I think that was just purely down to the drought. It was just a bad year to start on. Um, so that was that. That's what um, we put the fertilizer on early as well. We'll try to get it on early as we could. So we've got some urea on. Um, March, but I think because it just comes to dry in April as well, didn't it? Um, it didn't take effect really. Yeah. Did you have anything to add to that, Mark? Yeah, I think um, we just, I suppose Neil never really got ahead uh, with the grass to start with. So after, uh, after coming out of set stocking, there wasn't really the, the cover of grass there to, to really get going. And because of the dry spell, um, we just weren't able to build up that that cover of grass across the farm. And then I think the combination of a, a lot of those grasses on the permanent pasture, um, I think we, we could notice it quite clearly between a, a newer reseed and, and some of that permanent pasture that it just died to death in, in that drier weather. So again, a little bit more reseeding um, or slightly different grasses would have been of more benefit really. So do you think Neil would have had problems even without the drought, or do you think it was just literally bad luck in the year that year that we chose to start trying to improve this? Yeah, I think it was um, quite a bit of bad luck because hopefully if he was rotational grazing from the start, he would have had a higher cover built up from the winter. Um, again, the main principle, we're trying to rest more grass through the winter for, for the spring period so we have a higher cover. And then once you've got those higher covers, uh, the soils are going to dry out a lot slower and again the root depth goes down quite a bit more so again it's all of the benefits um, when you come to those drier periods it wouldn't have given you a heck of a lot more grass but it might have given you a, a two to three week buffer and then you could have made the, the decision slightly different then do we need to feed silage to slow them down or add a little bit of creep feed uh, I think the problem was with when that drought hit, uh, hit um, you know, it was quite hard to, to make decisions. Normally you'd have it later on, you could have weaned early, but obviously you couldn't do that at, at that stage. Um, and then some of the other options, 
uh, like at set home, we just decided to graze the silage fields, um, knowing that we could buy silage or or silage later in the year. So it was all about prioritising those, those ewes and lambs. So if um, if if Neil had been rotational grazing for a number of years beforehand, and he had that kind of two or three week buffer in front of him, how many years does it take you? To get to the point where you have that buffer is it from the first year of resting or is it kind of three years five years how long yeah it's literally if it's rested in the winter and, and it's managed that in that first season uh, there's no reason why you shouldn't be able to do it straight away so it can be as quick, quick as that really it's not like um, the grass has got to respond um you know it's got the ability to do it uh, no matter what if that makes sense so when would be the best time to start thinking about doing that then to make sure yeah. you get that resting period? Well, um, unfortunately, you're probably almost working six months ahead with grassland all the time. So, again, you normally start the season in um, late summer. So you're talking August, September time. Uh, we always aim to carry the, the most or highest cover of grass into early September. And then we're also putting down a little bit of nitrogen at that period of the year and that gives us a wedge of grass that we can go into for finishing lambs. Uh, hopefully we're not silaging at that time so we've got the whole farm to go at um, and then we've also got that grass available for tapping and then we'd be aiming then to rest, start resting fields from almost early or mid-December ready for lambing time. So it's not the whole the whole farm but it's a, a large proportion of it. Um, so that grass can be rested for turning out after lambing or if you're outside lambing um, that, that month before lambing, if that makes sense. Then you've got the covers, then you've got the cover of grass growing with the ewes, early fertiliser going down and because you've got that higher, higher cover, the grass will, will grow away with the sheep rather than it uh, disappearing by grazing it too early at a, a lower cover. So at this point then, it's probably good to ask our audience another question. Um, and we want to put, put the audience on the spot really and see whether they've started preparing for grazing 21. So Leah, could you just kick that second poll off for us, please? Yep. Okay, so this one is, have you started preparing for grazing 2021 yet? And your options are, yes, I'm strict on autumn closing. Yes, I've thought about it. I've tried to rest some ground over winter. Not really. We have a usual plan we'll try to follow. No, decisions are made on a daily basis rather than planning. Or I tried to plan but had to use the ground set aside for resting. And just while people are filling that in, um, Mark, if you hadn't thought um, about grazing 2021 until tonight, um, and this was the first thought about, oh, I don't know what I'm going to do. What would your advice be? Yeah, um, you, you're going to be a little stuck, obviously, because you know, you're just about to start lambing, so the grass is going to magically appear. But um, what I would be looking to do would, would be starting to look at options for, for after lambing. So you'd be looking at, um, say, if you're lambing um, mid to late March, You'd be then looking to start maybe rotational grazing by late April. And then uh, that would be one of the easier ways of getting into it uh, from that point. So you'd probably start by splitting a couple of fields in two and moving the sheep from side to side. Then you'd bring in another field split in two and again start moving them around the four fields. And then you've got a little bit of a rotation moving, which will then allow you to increase a couple of fields. And then from that point, you'd be able to manage your grass. If you've got too much grass in front of the sheep, you'd then be looking at possibly silaging one of those little fields or paddocks or even a half the field uh, with brown bale silage. Or if you're, you're short, you'd then be looking to bring another field into that, that rotation. So that's generally how I, I aim to start, start doing it. Hey, Leah, have we got some answers? Yeah, so here we go. Have you started preparing for grazing 2021 yet? 23% of the audience said yes, they're on strict autumn closing. 51% of the majority said yes, thought about it, tried to rest some ground over winter. 
3% have said not really, we have a usual plan we'll try to follow, 6% have said no, decisions are made on a daily basis rather than planning, and 17% have said try to plan but had to use ground set aside for resting. Right, That's, I don't know, has anybody got any comments on that? Yeah, I think um, probably the, the general issue is that um, the cows are coming in the autumn, they'll be housed, and then the sheep are spread out over the rest of the farm, uh, nail the grass until January, February time, then they might be housed for lambing. And you've just got that lack of cover across the, the farm when you're looking to turn back out to lamb. And then you've got the knock-on effect then that um, you can't get your cows out until May because that's the, when the grass finally pips its head up uh, and can start to get away. So it's a bit of a double whammy and it, it's really can be quite hard to get yourself out of that cycle, but you've got to be quite strict about it uh, and plan whether that's, uh, I know we'll go into it later in the talk, but whether that's through housing longer, root crops or, or sacrifice paddocks. So it, it's all going to be thought of uh, quite early in the season. Leah? I've got a couple of questions here. So um, first one's for Neil. Um, in the past, uh, probably before strategic farms, how much ground would you normally reseed each year? So we'd probably do about 10 acres. So it's not enough really, but yeah, maybe about 10 acres just depends on our rotations, arable rotations, but um, normally sort of uh, plow a grass field up and then put a crop of barley in and then have a root crop and then maybe back to back to grass but yeah be about 10 acres a year probably and how big is the land that you the size that you're grazing just to put that into context what, 300 what acres of grazing okay and uh neil what soil types are you dealing with on farm so we're mainly pretty heavy clay up here um so yeah heavy soils okay um, Mark, what are your thoughts on residuals for optimum regrowth? Um, really, if you're trying to maintain quality, you want to be getting it down to that golf ball height, really, which is about four centimetres or about 1,500. Um, again, later in the season, uh, you'd probably go a little bit higher than that. Um, again, just to try and maintain that moisture over, over the summer period. Thank you. Um, again, for you, Mark, when would you recommend applying fertiliser in the spring? Um, really, yeah, it's just weather dependent nowadays. So really, once that soil temperature is above five degrees for, for about 10 days, um, you can actually go out and get a response. But, um, you know, farms probably on the on Anglesey or the Thing Peninsula or down in the southwest or even going as early as January because the soils are that much warmer and because of that, that uh, climate next to the sea. Obviously, we're more inland and you probably the earliest people on south facing slopes might be going mid February where it's a little bit warmer um, or it's going to be mid, mid or early March for some of those heavier farms. So that's when you when you're talking but it's it's really all about the weather really and getting that warmth i know i think we're getting a little bit of warmth coming up over the weekend well 17 degrees down in london i don't know what it's doing in london so might um, be a neil, chance neil another question for you um roughly how many weeks before lambing do you house your ewes and is this something you're looking to change so yeah i'm not um too keen on housing the ewes too early so I'd bring them in a fortnight before lambing um, but if I can't get enough sheep away over the winter um, I'm looking to get more away over the winter um, I could do with a good relationship with a dairy farmer um, but um, we might have to look at housing a bit earlier thank you um, and one final one for Mark um, in midsummer, grass goes to head very quickly. Topping doesn't do any good. So, would you recommend mowing instead as soon as stock move around the rotation? Yeah, um, mowing's a, a good way of getting that residual down and getting that fresh regrowth. So, again, um, particularly with with sheep or with young cattle, um, 
especially with cats, and quite often find some of the pasture goes stale because they'll, they'll sit and, and lie and pee and poo in the same places. So it just allows that nice clean sward to, to start again. But again, it's, it's looking for that moisture around, or if there's no moisture, you know, there's no point doing it because it just opens the sward up and it's going to be drier for it and it'll, yeah, be slower to restart again. Okay, thanks. That's it, Emma. Thanks, Leah. So, Mark, thinking specific to Neil then, um, with this improved grassland management, with the rotation, with getting more out of his forage, um, what are the realistic benefits you're kind of expecting from him, short and long term? Yeah, <clears throat> I suppose um, initially it's it's going to be prioritising that that better silage. So we're we're going to be looking at you know reducing the the cattle feed probably by 60 70 percent that's really what we we'd like to get down to um and then with the sheep um again they're not too far away with with um the ewes pre lambing um it'd be nice to get some better silage there but really the priority is going to be the lambs and getting that, that creek feed build down so again you're doing a lot of um grazing with with rape uh which is a good way of getting into the system to get more of those reseeds up and coming and then hopefully that allows us to put some of these these better silage lays and um, red clover lays in which again will give us more options again for finishing lambs if that makes sense and then hopefully then there'll be a bigger area of rotational grazing just for those lambs on very good high quality lush swords um, the sheep you know once they've been weaned they can go in that permanent pasture uh, be mobbed up into bigger groups, and kept quite tight. And then I suppose the longer term aim is, you know, what can we increase that stocking rate by? <clears throat> if we increase it by 20, 30 percent, um, you know, with the same, well, with a lot less feed. So it's just those key management decisions, really. Stocking rate is key. And, and second, it's, it's getting those lambs away. And thirdly, it's, um, yeah, just reducing feed use. And do you think it could do anything for soil health or is, is are there benefits there? Yeah, the, with the rotational grazing, um, generally you're going to have better soil health because the root depth is going to be lower because uh, if it makes sense, the more grass you've got above the ground, because uh, you always carry a higher cover, the, the deeper the roots will be throughout. It tends to mirror what you see above the ground. And um, I think you even given uh, or got the option of GS4, haven't you, Neil, I think, in a couple of fields, potentially. Yeah. So, again, with some of those those herbed chicory plantain, that deep taproot, so you can get down into that soil, uh, and again, hopefully be a bit better for the soil health. Okay. So, Neil, with a thought to what you've done kind of over the autumn, winter then with resting ground, do you want to just um, talk us through kind of what you've been doing to get a better head start this year? So we've probably rested um, a good 60 acres of the of the farm, um, which has had nothing on since October. Um, so there's a nice bit of cover of grass there now. Um, we've had the ewes sort of kept them into bigger bunches on sort of sacrifice fields so at the feed hay a lot earlier this year so just kept them on tight on on the drier fields on the drier ground and um, kept them there till now and now we're feeding concentrates as well and ad lib molasses and then be looking to house them now fortnight pre-lambing um, but mainly is resting more ground over the winter is what we've done so far okay and Mark, I'm just going to share some photos for you to talk us through, please, with kind of May to February um, and what some of Neil's ground has looked like. Yeah. Uh, so I suppose if we if we start off with the picture in the middle at the bottom, uh, that would be May 20. So again, that was uh, when you're looking to start the rotational grazing. You can see on the right hand side uh, currently being grazed, and then the idea would be to move into the left. Um, the only, I think uh, I mentioned, the only issue Neil was having was that his fields were quite big for the group sizes of sheep he was having. So he wasn't really able to get the, you know, by splitting them just in two, he wasn't able to get the, the grazing pressure required. 
to, to bring those swords down within two or three days. So um, that's where we're, we're aiming to try and keep bigger mobs of sheep together to reduce the electric fencing. Really. Uh, the other alternative is a lot more electric fencing to, to make those those little paddocks a, a lot smaller. Um, we've then got uh, some of the, the permanent pasture there in the top left hand with um, uh, North Country mules. That is kind of your typical kind of grassland across um, a lot of the farm. Um, unfortunately, uh, when we when you go to assess how much rye grass and clovers in that sward, there's, there's very little. There's a lot of wheat grasses, so we, we just weren't getting. That's why we weren't getting that response uh, through the summer period, really. So that was quite noticeable. Uh, so hopefully with the rape and maybe even some winter root crops, uh, something like Swedes, we can start to, on some of that drier ground, we can start to outwinter some of those sheep to rest more of the other ground and get a bit more of a rotation going. Um, the other two fields there um, in December with the, the higher grass covers, again, that's what we were aiming to carry through to the spring. So ideally the sheep would be turned out to these fields, um, you know, in, in late March, early April, uh, set stock for, for a month or a little bit longer. And uh, again, those sheep would have plenty to go out and the concentrate use could be cut a little bit quicker. So lots of high quality feed there. Um, the, the brown field, the sacrifice field, so again, this was on uh, that wet period we had. Um, Really what we were aiming to do was feed more silage uh, and hay on these sacrifice fields, keep the stock a little bit tighter to, be, to allow us to, to rest some of those fields for lambing. So because we haven't got any root crops or, or Neil didn't want to house early, this is really the only option we had to try and rest, rest some more ground. But um, the aim would be that this grass would then be rested really until almost late late April, early May, when the, the sheep have lambed and they're starting to get mobbed back, they can be moved onto this ground, leaving those lambing fields to, to then be used for silage, if that makes sense. So it's all trying to work out a, a pattern of moving stock uh, to rest certain fields and allow other fields to, to have covers of grass at the right time. Okay, Leah, did we have some questions on that? Yeah, first one is uh, we've been using a rotation of three days store cattle and then three days using lambs with no return for three weeks. Should this be sheep first instead to ensure they get the freshest grass? Yeah, so I suppose <clears throat> I'm not 100% deeming that um, the store cattle go in for three days and then the sheep go in for three afterwards. I think so, they, yeah. yeah, that's what they mean. So, um, really the, those two groups of stock need to be kept separate and probably need to be uh, three days in each separate paddock if that makes sense so what you do with it, the store cattle are obviously getting the best bite uh, they'll be growing at 1.2 1.3 kilos a day and then the ewes with lambs will just have the rubbish that's left so they'll have a lot more dead leaf um, and again lower quality grass so their growth rates are really going to drop off. So really with ewes and lambs and with those store cattle, they need to be prioritised and it should be suckler cows coming behind to, to mop up because they can, uh, any poor quality grass, they can convert into milk for the, for the calves. Um, or you're looking at cull ewes or some other stock class to, to come in behind them if you're looking to clear up. But you've got to give those stock the, the best grass if that makes sense. Um, and Neil, do you feed any fodder beet to your stock? No, we don't feed fodder beet. We just feed adlin molasses um, from the end of January right through to lambing. And um, when did you start feeding concentrates relative to your lambing day and how much do you feed? So um, we sort of feed concentrates on uh, relation to the analysis of the hay. Um, so beginning of February, all the Suffolks that start lambing from mid-March are fed concentrates. Um, I think this year they started off on about um, 350 grams a head a day. Um, I think we're up to now just over half a kilo. Um, with the molasses as well, that's holding them quite well. And then just ad-lib hay. Um, the triplets are actually housed now, 
So we brought those in beginning of February because um, the ground was just getting wet and it was easier to bring those in. So we've housed the triplets. They're on ad lib silage. They're on that better quality silage that we've made for the young stock. Um, so they're on just over half a kilo a day with ad lib molasses as well. Okay. I just want to ask you really quickly, Neil, before we move on to um, Mark to give us um, another section that he's got, is just how have you found resting the ground? As in, um, how have you resisted the temptation in autumn to open the gates and and just use a field here or there, or like the like the picture in February, watch watch a field get chopped up? How have you how have you kind of coped with that? Yeah, it's not been too bad. Um, it wasn't so good when um, back January, like when this um, sacrifice field was so wet, it wasn't very nice going round. But I'm going driving, having to drive through my fields where a nice cover of grass to get to these fields. So it's so tempting to open the gate, but no, it's been all right. Um, I have managed to get a few more ewes away this winter, so off farm, but I'm looking to get a lot more away off you know, off farm really over the winter, the more the better. But um, so they've got the ewe lambs and the yearlings off farm at the moment. Um, so they'll be returning soon. So this is where I need to get the the first lot of ewes housed so they can go onto their sacrifice fields for now without opening the gate on the on the good grass. <laughs> I think Mark was threatening to come and put locks on the wall at one point, wasn't he? Yeah. <laughs> um, Right, just as a bit of a next step then, what I want to do is just talk about some of the um, science behind what Neil's been doing and the reasons why. So Mark, for now, I'm just gonna hand over to you um, and let you talk us through your slides. Okay, thank you. Right, so um, yeah, first slide, how does ryegrass grow? I mean, so this is all the principles behind uh, rotational grazing, really, why we're, we're aiming to do it. And uh, the reasons for it. So on the on the left hand side, um, on the top left hand side, you should see that it says grazing height, um, and there's a little grass shoot there. So really, that's the situation after the grass has been nailed quite hard. That's at three to four centimeters, and underneath it, there's a, a bit of a wavy line showing uh, the plant reserves levels. So obviously, when you've got a, a very short uh, leaf on the plant, it's having to take up a lot of reserves from the roots to be able to put up um, its first shoot. So as we move from the left of the chart to the right, um, the ryegrass plant uses a lot of energy reserves to sip up its first shoot. <coughs> then um, it's able to photosynthesize and collect uh, more energy and stick up a, a second uh, new leaf. So now it's starting to recover those energy reserves. And by the time we've got to the third new leaf, um, it's basically going flat out, it's photosynthesizing, uh, it's getting lots of nice sun and energy. And then finally, by the time we get to it putting up a fourth new leaf, uh, the first one will always die off. So on the ryegrass plant, you're only ever going to have uh, three live leaves. So when this comes to grazing, what we're aiming to do is actually graze it uh, before we get to this fourth leaf, which allows the first one to die. So generally we'll aim to graze it anywhere between the second leaf and the third leaf. So what we're trying to compromise here on is the ability of uh, the grass to grow as quickly as possible and have as many leaves as possible, but we don't want the stock eating that dead leaf. So that's why we always try and graze between the second and third leaf. So for instance, if a lamb eats uh, that one leaf, it's going to reduce growth rates by about 100 grams a day, if that makes sense. So we want as much grass cover as we want, or as we can, but we've got to also remember that that quality is going to drop off after a certain point, if that makes sense. Okay, uh, next slide, please. Uh, the other important point is uh, that nutrients are, are key. Uh, you know, it's about getting your, your line is essential, getting that correct, getting that between six and six and a half. For instance, uh, phosphate uh, locks up by about 50% as soon as it gets down to pH six. So that's why we're aiming for almost 6.3 to 6.5 uh, for grassland. 
Uh, this chart here, um, I'm sure most of you have heard of Charlie Morgan, but back in his younger years, uh, this is going back to 1990, um, they did a uh, experiment at Bromid Mauer, which is an upland research farm. And um, basically, they did four experiments. They did a set stocking situation uh, where the grass received lime, P, K, and nitrogen. And um, what this chart is showing that over a six, seven year period, uh, that top line is going straight across from the 100%, just gives you the, the stocking rate. Um, at that level. And then the other three, as we move down, uh, the first one is obviously nitrogen. Uh, the second one down is showing a drop in stocking rate because it's not being applied with nitrogen. The third one down is then only receiving lime and not receiving P and K. And then the final one is receiving no nutrients at all. So what we're trying to show there is that the stocking rate has dropped by 60% on that uh, sward, which has received uh, no nutrients at all. So it's important, even if you're organic, to try and maintain that, that line, P, K, and nitrogen. The one thing we, that was noticed from this experiment, that there was, there was only 10% clover in the swards to start with. So if we had 30% clover, like we're trying to aim for, uh, that second option with uh, lime, phosphate and potash would probably be, you know, 85 to 90%, if that makes sense. So it just shows what that effect on stocking rate can be by that lack of inputs. Okay, next slide, please. Uh, this is just going back to what we were talking about uh, with the question or the poll. So we're just looking at the, the different options in terms of set stocking, uh, set stocking with a little bit of movement, rotational grazing and paddock grazing, and the utilization uh, or what we can graze with the stock. So basically with set stocking, the sheep are there all year round, it's, it's not getting a rest. Uh, with set stocking with movements, you're probably moving the sheep every 15 days, 20 days, something like that, and they're just moving around the farm slowly. Rotational grazing, you're probably moving them every four to five days, and then you're up at 65, 70% utilization. Um, but with paddock grazing, you're probably moving um, every two days or even less than that. So the dairy farmer, for instance, would be moving every 12 hours, every time they milk, uh, they'll be into a new paddock. And really, the more you do that, just those stock are able to graze down quite hard, clear out the sward and get that nice fresh regrowth. Well, if you can imagine a sheep or cattle have been in a field for 10 days, by the time they get to the, you know, sixth, seventh day in there, it's not very tasty for them. They've walked all over it, you know, weed and poodle all over it. And um, you're just wasting so much grass. So that's why we say that we're looking for those much shorter times uh, in each, each paddock, okay? Um, grass wedge, so this is really important uh, with rotational grazing and why we need a wedge um, and by wedge we mean um, the different heights of grass across the farm. If all the grass was the same height and you turned your cows out in May, um, obviously the first field you, you would graze or the first few would be fine but by the time you got to the, the tenth field or tenth paddock that'll probably be about two foot tall and you'd waste it all and have to silage it. So what we're aiming for uh, by managing our grass in the autumn by closing our fields out off slowly. So for instance, with cattle, our last grazing rotation might be in October. Uh, the first fields grazed might have been the 1st of October, but we would carry on grazing until maybe mid-November. So that first field on the 1st of October that was grazed would not be grazed then until mid-February. And then the last field, which was grazed in the middle of November, wouldn't be grazed probably until the first week in April. So then when you come through to the spring, you've got different covers of grass in those fields, and it allows that grass to, to uh, recover. In front of you. So it'd be the same principle with sheep, just obviously slightly lesser covers. And all it means is that you maintain uh, a tighter control on that grass, 
and you don't need to to waste so much later in that spring when that may uh, peak grass growth occurs. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, so this was this was the key bit uh, for Neil. Um, it's trying to rest that ground. So whether that's coming from sacrifice fields or if it's looking to compromise throughout. So probably one of the most obvious ones um, is looking to outwinter. So we've got pictures of sheep on fodder beet or swedes. Obviously with fodder beet, it's a very high yielding crop. So you're needing very dry fields uh, to make it work, which might not be suitable for Neil. Uh, uh, swedes, again, uh, quite a good hardy crop. Uh, will keep sheep very well over the winter. And we'd probably work quite well on some of those drier permanent pasture fields at Neil, at Neil's, and you could keep quite a considerable amount of sheep for probably 60, 70 days on Swedes there. We then at the bottom, uh, bottom left, we've got your, your sacrifice fields with, with silage. Um, that's one way of doing it on some of the, the heavier farms if you're not happy with putting root crops in. And then on the right hand corner, bottom right hand corner, we've then got all grass wintering, which you quite often will see on on, on farms where it's a little bit milder, so maybe in the southwest, Flean Peninsula, Anglesey, you've got a little bit more growth through the winter. Uh, you divide your fields up into maybe a hundred paddocks, and those sheep in one or two big mobs move all the way around the farm, and that's how that works. And then the other two options is going to be house them for eight, ten weeks, uh, which is more expensive, but again, it might only be might be the only option or we look to tax sheep out, so whether that's on stubble turnips or dairy farm grass, um, but it's really important to, to rest that grass for quite a long period. It could be 60, 70 days, uh, especially those lavender fields. Okay, next slide. So in terms of working out a rotation, what I've done here is to try and keep it as, as simple as possible. So if we looked at a standard uh, say sheep mob of maybe 200 sheep and twin lambs. Again, this is going to differ for, for every farm because you might have blocks of ground at, at different sizes, but also you've got to be able to handle 250 sheep and, and twin lambs and you're going to need good dogs to get a mob size of, of that in as well. So if we're looking at a 65 kilo uh, ewe, uh, we'd be eating about 3% intake. So it'd work out at just under two kilos a head of dry matter it would be eating. 250 ewes would then be just under 500 kilos a head, uh, sorry, per group per day at 488. Then when we're looking to look at the grass available, we'd be looking at an entry cover of about two and a half thousand kilos, which would be, say, a Coke can stood up. And then we'd be aiming to drop it down to 1,500 kilos, which would be a, a golf ball height. So that would actually leave us about 1,000 kilos available in the middle. So nice, simple mass. If we had two hectares, we'd have 2,000 kilos available. So at, say, 500 kilos, those sheep are going to be needing to eat. Uh, divide 500, uh, into 500 into 2,000, it's four days in each paddock. So that's as... It's trying to keep it simple, really. So how I look at it, that's, uh, that's a five-acre field um, to be nice and practical. Those sheep are in there for four days and then moved into the next five-acre field. Most farms have five or ten-acre fields. So they can be split into two or kept as they are. Again, 20-acre fields split into four. So it's trying to make it as, as simple as possible for, you, for yourselves. But again, increasing that mob size to 250 is the key bit because that makes it easy for you. We've then got the rotation length. Uh, so if we're growing at 50 kilos a day, um, we're aiming for a thousand kilos uh, cover in between that we can graze. So we look at um, dividing the thousand by 50 and it comes to a 20 day rotation. Uh, so 20 divided by four equals five paddocks because obviously we were aiming for four days in each, if that makes sense. And uh, the key thing there is flexibility. Uh, you might need extra paddocks if it goes dry or, or grass growth drops off. And then also, if grass gets ahead, uh, quite often you'll have to go in and silage. So at least with a bigger mob, 
uh, of 250 ewes, you're going in and silaging five acres rather than one acre. You know, it gets a, a little bit more easy to come in and, and take out those fields individually. Okay. Right, so quickly on to sort of trying to maximize growth from forage. So what I what I've done, I've just broken it up into ewes and lambs, weaning, and then growing and finishing cattle. I think for ewes and lambs, the key thing is to try and get two to three day breaks, ideally. Uh, they're better than four to five day breaks. And as I said before, if you can imagine the sheep go into a field, the first thing they'll do is eat the clover. Uh, they'll eat the top third of the grass and get the best pickings. As you can imagine, by the time they've been in there five days, you know, they're eating stalks and, and rubbish at the bottom of the sward. So again, you're trying to minimize that. If they've got two days of eating uh, the rubbish at the bottom, they're not going to grow. So we're aiming for those quicker breaks of two to three days. We're then also aiming to hit the residuals hard. So that golf hole height is, is what we're looking at, especially in the spring. If it gets out of control, it means that grass will lose its quality and go to seed head too early. So that's vital for us to maintain those growth rates as the milk yield drops in those ewes. And, you know, once those lambs are getting eight uh, to eight to ten weeks of age, they're going to be eating a lot of grass and it needs to be quality. And then I would always prioritize the twins over the singles. So the twins would get the best grass. Um, if that means you keeping them in a the field for two days and then bringing in the singles behind them or even suck the cows behind them to mop up, uh, do it. Moving on to, to weaning, uh, really, oh sorry, we're, we're looking at um, high clover and herb content, we're looking at that much higher protein, but they're also a lot more digestible than ryegrass midsummer. Again, we're aiming for grass covers a, a little bit higher, six to nine centimetres, and we're aiming for those lambs just to take the top third of that grass. So probably only utilisation would be 30%. And then move them on to the next field so they're getting the best of everything and then you're mopping up behind them with uh, the dry ewes or with suckler cows uh, or any other livestock class if possible and then um, finally with growing and finishing cattle um, priority really is don't overfeed during the winter we're looking for them to have compensatory growth in the spring and hit a, a rise in plane of nutrition if you overfeed them you'll be in exactly the same position. They just wouldn't have grown for the first two months of grass. So you've chucked all that concentrates at them for, for no benefit. Different if you're selling store cattle straight off farm and you're wanting them to make, you know, look nice and flashy in the market, market in March and April. But, you know, those are the cattle I would be avoiding to buy because they're going to sink. We're then looking at uh, slightly higher covers, uh, 2,800. So that's somewhere between a Coke can and a, and a beer can. Uh, as an entry and then dropping it down to that golf ball height of 1500. Uh, and then after the spring, once we're starting to hit that um, summer period, some of the grass might go to head. Uh, so we're actually looking to then go out and primo uh, to allow those cattle to actually eat, eat it directly off the floor or we go in afterwards and, and mow it after them. So then we're getting uh, some nice high quality regrowth for them. We can also take some of those um, fields out for silage, so there's some nice high quality grass there. And in a perfect world, we'd be aiming for two day shifts. So again, they're only having probably half a day of clearing out the bottom of the sward and one and a half days of, of eating good quality. There's no reason why those shouldn't be doing, you know, 1.2 to 1.4 kilos a day. Final bit is on silage quality. So there's a little graph there showing um, the quality of the silage in terms of dry matter digestibility. Um, and basically, the higher it is, the higher the live weight gain. So if you've got a 75 DMD, which is equivalent to 72 D value, uh, you're talking about 0.8 to the kilo growth through the winter without any concentrates. Well, as you drop off down to 65, you can see that it's dropped to about half a kilo on that silage alone. So there's you know, massive potential there um, if you get that silage correct. OK. 
I was on mute. Um, Leah, have we got a few questions? Yeah. Um, so, Mark, um, if triplets are on good silage, are they more likely to prolapse? Um, not necessarily. It, it would tend to be more related, actually, to the concentrate use and what you're doing with that, especially if you're, you're feeding them in one hit rather than spreading it um, over in two feeds or even TMR. You'll find that if you're using the TMR, uh, the prolapse rate drops off quite significantly because you, every time you give them concentrates, um, the room and pH will, will drop off and they're unable to utilise the, the forage properly. Um, and does paddock grazing reduce live weight of lambs and cattle? Sorry, say again. Does paddock grazing reduce live weight of lambs and cattle? In terms of cattle, it would probably increase the, the live weight gain uh, compared to set stocking. What you can find uh, with sheep and with lambs is you'll normally be able to keep a much higher stocking rate, but the actual growth rate of the lambs will slightly drop off. So there, that's why probably for the twins, you're aiming to prioritise them and make them not graze out the bottom of the sword quite as much, if that makes sense. Um, with paddock grazing, would you find that you're having to apply additional P and K or is the input from the livestock enough? Uh, again, it's all dependent on your soils to start with. Uh, the one thing that you will find is that uh, the P and K is spread out more evenly across the field. Uh, because they're forced to, to graze the whole lot and they, they wouldn't tend to sit in one part quite the same as they would if they were set stocked. Um, but if you, you will always remove phosphate if you're removing stock. So if you're selling fat cattle or store cattle, they require phosphate, which are taken from the grass. So the higher the stocking rate, which will probably go up in terms of stocking rate, the more phosphate you'll need to put back. But that just comes with higher stocking rates and higher removal of, of phosphate. Okay, and if you're paddock grazing, how long must you tuck for on grass before you can put them on roots? Um, it shouldn't really be, be an issue as long as you transition them onto it. So what I wouldn't want you to do is pull them straight off the grass and chuck them straight on the root crop. Uh, what I'd want you to do is spend four or five days of putting them on and off to adjust them slowly and then it shouldn't be an issue. You've got to think of them exactly as a, as a dairy farmer with treated dairy cow. You know, they're always obsessed with transition and, you know, they've got a dry feed and they transition onto a, uh, you know, after they've calved them to a, they'll have a high yield mix, a low yield mix. So it's transition is everything. Okay. Mark, do you really quickly just want to mention um, these and then I'll um, come back to asking things of Neil? Yeah, so uh, in terms of measurements, um, some of these tools can be quite useful just to try and gauge, you know, what, what I've been talking about really, because it's really quite hard to understand what 1500 kilos or 2000 kilos is. But um, Normally, I would go out and you can get one of the sword sticks on the right hand side free of AHDB. Um, again, that's quite a useful tool and all you would do is put uh, a clipboard down so it's slightly compressed uh, and then take the figure off, off the, the roulette to give you an idea of, of, of measurements. Uh, the next step up then would uh, be getting a plate meter and then that would allow you to budget and put a lot more information into a uh, software package, uh, perhaps, um, God, I can't think of it now, the one I was thinking. What's the, the Irish one? Um, I, gonna, I don't know if you... Uh, were you going to say AgriWeb or something? AgriWeb, yeah. AgriWeb. Um, <laughs> I'm glad I picked the right one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, AgriNet, sorry, not AgriWeb. AgriNet, Agri right. Yeah, that's it. But I think AgriWeb have, have something equivalent. So um, you can, can then put all this data in, it will give you budgets, and it will give you a wedge of grass so you know exactly where you are. But to be quite honest, as a beef and sheep farmer, once you get your eye in, um, I'm quite happy with farmers just going coke can to golf ball. Um, that works quite effectively throughout. Mm -hmm. so again, just a little mark on your welly. And once you've been doing it for, for a while, you, you can probably just judge it by eye. And I think it's it's only if you're really looking to push it to that extreme level, you go into paddock 
paddock grazing and really pushing, that's then when you wanted to do more budgets and, and more software. Brilliant. Thank you, Mark. Um, just uh, we've got about 10 minutes left. So I just wanted to cover before we finish kind of where you go next, Neil, and what your next steps are. So how is your ground looking now compared to other years? Um, a lot greener. <laughs> so, yeah, we'd have a, a lot more grass about now than uh, the normal years. Um, this year probably helped as well by having all the fat lambs gone by Christmas and all the coal use. It's um, something we've done in the past is keep them to spring when the prices get better, but they've all gone out of the way, so uh, it's less stock eating. So, yeah, there is a lot more grass about to turn out for some using lambs. And when you do get to the point of turnout, what's the plan? So just turn out using lambs, so set stock those for about a month. Um, the sacrifice fields will be resting um, and then probably mob up some using lambs, um, about 200 in a bunch, and then start rotating them round. Um, probably leave about 20, 20 acres allocated to the store cattle, so I'll have 30 weanlings to turn out um, and rotate them on there. So. Um, and That's what's the kind of plan with your inputs when you when are you hoping to get your fert out so fertilizer um early as possible um so it'll probably be looking hopefully mid um beginning of march okay and mark what are the key things obviously we don't know what grazing 2021 is going to be like what are the key things you can do if we get too much grass and equally if we don't get enough grass yeah I suppose if you've got too much grass, um, again, it's, it's just drop any fertilizer use because you don't need to be using that, that extra nitrogen. Um, then it's it's really just trying. I think it's always harder to manage grass if you've got too much. Um, your stock will do worse if you've got less of it. Um, and see so if you've got too much because um, the digest digestibility drops off. So really it'd be a matter of just taking as much as possible for silage. Um, really that adds expense to the system so like in a perfect world you'd be able to buy in some store lambs or something to try and utilize it uh, that would be probably of more benefit than you know wasting 10 15 quid a bale on, on um, contractors and everything else i think if you're in a dry period um it all depends i think last year it was a very tricky time because it came very early which you, you wouldn't normally have normally it would come mid-season so you can wean early, um, get those ewes nice and tight and put them out of the way to prioritize the lambs. Um, you could probably reduce some of your silage area uh, with the aim of taking maybe a, a later cut or perhaps buying in some, some hay for the sheep as uh, Neil, could, Neil could do. Uh, it's just about looking at things a little bit differently. Uh, even in a dry spell, maybe introducing creek feed uh, because you, you've gone short of grass, that means then you rest in more grass and you'll get a few lambs away a little bit earlier. So it's just trying to, to work into the system just to allow that grass rotation to slow down and get those, those covers a little bit higher again, if that makes sense. And how long does it generally take for um, your grazing management to be part of the routine? And is getting started actually the hardest part? And once you've got into the rhythm of it, it starts to become a bit more natural. Yeah, um, it's probably going to take a good couple of years to, to start getting the, the hang hang of it and realizing what you need to be doing. But again, you know, a full system on a farm and getting that grass to management is probably going to take five years uh, before it's fully set up and everything's running how you want it. But that's probably similar to, to most new systems you're working at. I mean, I suppose the only downside of it is that with grass every year is different you know you're having a wet spell or a dry spell and it's very weather related so the keys key point is to be flexible with with every decision you're making and uh, you might make one decision one week and then you might have to do a u-turn and, and change change thoughts completely the next week okay leah if you've got some you can have three questions okay um, first up then, hi, uh, we struggled to cut fields which become overgrown due to dung patches from cattle. What would you suggest, Mark? Okay, so sorry, just repeat again. 
Uh, we struggle to cut fields which become overgrown due to dung patches from cattle. What would you suggest? Yeah, um, th there shouldn't be too much. I, I don't know whether they mean that, um, that they're unable to graze it uh, where those dung patches are. Um, if that was the case, I would go in and primo it and get the cattle then to come and eat it directly off the ground. For some reason, uh, that might be better rather than taking a silage cut. Um, once it's been left a day to dry, they'll suck the cow or any kind of cat. I'll always mop it off, off the floor, but they won't eat it if it was there living. It's really bonkers, but um, that's that's what they do. So you might be better off pre mowing it, getting the cattle to eat it, rather than silaging it, if that's the case. Okay, um, and a question for Neil. Do you ever sward lift or spike any fields in the spring, um, especially your sacrifice fields? Yeah, we do sword lift. Um, don't do it in the spring, though. We do it September time, and yeah, working our way around the whole farm. But yeah, don't don't tend to do it in the spring. Have I got time for more, Emma? Oh, one. You can have one. Okay, Mark. Um, do many farmers consider their extra labour costs for moving electric fencing uh, when analysing their economic return of the system? Yeah. Um, in terms of the electric fences, most most farmers are going to see the stock every day. Uh, so in terms of moving the stock, I just don't, you know, you open the gate and they run through. So that's no extra difference. Uh, what I encourage farms to do is set it up so they've got enough fences all the time. So for instance, on a farm, you buy 10 or 15 sets and then they're set up once and they stay up all year round. And then all you've got to do is, is go to them and uh, just open the end up, if that makes sense, and stock run through. Um, if you're having to, if you've got one fence and you're having to take it up every time, that's when it's going to get boring and that extra labour, and you're less likely to do the rotational grazing system. Okay. Thanks, Leah. For anybody that had questions that we didn't get round to answering tonight, um, we do actually get an output of those questions afterwards, so we can come back to you on it. So I'm, I'm sorry we haven't got round all of you, um, but we will follow up with you. Um, just as a final question for you, Neil, if you had to pass on, at the point you're at at the moment, if you had to pass on two things to another farmer that you've learned that you think it's really worth them considering or what you know now that you didn't know before what would they be um as we're planning ahead plan a rotation um you've got to be looking at grazing fields at the right time at the right height um with the right amount of stock um and rest plenty of ground over the winter brilliant and mark a top tip from you if you're going to start grazing from tonight well, it's not start grazing start thinking about improving grazing from tonight yeah um it's, it's just about probably the easiest step is mobbing mobbing stock together to make bigger groups uh, so you can move them around quicker and then it's probably just aiming for that two to three days in each paddock for each field and, and keep them moving okay brilliant well thank you very much to both of you for your time tonight and Leah as well who's been working away in the background um, making sure things run smoothly just a couple of things I want to cover um, before I end the webinar is that a lot of there are a lot of resources available on the AHDB Knowledge Library. The quickest way to get to that is probably to Google AHDB Knowledge Library. But if there's a piece of information you're after that you can't find, please get in touch with a member of AHDB staff because 90% of the time it's there. It'll just need digging out. Um, so please don't be afraid to pick up the phone. Um, or send an email to somebody at AHDB and we'll sort it out for you. Um, regardless of where you are in the country, you all have a beef and lamb representative for your area. Um, so find out who they are and, and drop them a line. Um, just as far as after you get, um, after this webinar is finished, you'll receive an email. And what you'll get on that email is a request for your feedback, which please, please fill it in. We do read them. Um, we do take note of them. And where it's possible, we do make changes um, to our webinars and our events to, to make them as the best for you that we can. Um, this list of resources on the page as well will be emailed out to you. So there'll be 
um, the Planning Grazing Strategies for Better Returns book, which is available in hard copy too if you need it, along with all the other things on that list. And as Mark mentioned earlier, we do have a free sword, uh, sword stick as well. So please order one of those if you'd like one. Um, Forage for Knowledge is a regular email, I think it's weekly, that goes out that during the grazing season that just updates you on what grass, gr grass growth is like um, and just giving advice on how to deal with whatever the um, grazing season is throwing at the time. So again, there will be a link in that email to sign up to that if you're interested. We are in the middle of Strategic Farm Month at the moment. Um, so next week we will be joining on the 23rd to the Tuesday, Adrian Coombe, who's from down in Cornwall, to talk about whether his pet lambs, tame lambs, cade lambs, whatever you want to call them, um, whether they're making a profit or a loss for him, and just have that conversation. And on the 24th, we'll be going to Northumberland as well. So to um, register for either of those events, exactly the same as you have done for tonight, please just go to AHDB um, events. Other than that, Thank you very much for listening. Um, I hope you've enjoyed it and enjoy the rest of your evenings. Okay, thank you.